All right. Hey, everybody. Joe Casabona here. Thanks so much for joining me on the Monday live stream. I have a very special guest. This is a I don't really do too many guest based uh, live or live streams, but I do have with us today uh, Ronnie Burt uh, over at you. Now, Ronnie, you are the um, you are a, a business lead at Automatic. Did I write that right? Yeah, that. I mean we're not we're not big on titles or anything, yeah. so that's just kind of what what we've come up with. Nice. Yeah. Um, and you work primarily on on Sensei, is that accurate? Yeah, and and a few other plugins and things, but uh, big focus is definitely on the Sensei LMS plugin. Nice. Awesome. Uh, well, I'm really excited to have you here today talking about um, AI uh, and and kind of what it means for course creation. This is, I mean. This is like the flavor of the six months, right? Is is AI yeah. and how we can integrate it into stuff. Um, I and I while I've been putting a lot of thought into, um, like podcasting, uh, and how how, uh, you know, we can we can use uh AI in podcasting. I haven't really thought about it, uh, through the lens of of course creation, and so I'm really excited for that. Now, if you are tuning in on the live stream, you can ask questions. Let us know who you are, where you're coming from. Leave comments here. I'll also just say, if you're watching on YouTube and you want to watch my lights blink, you can do a super chat or a super sticker. Um, and uh, so, like, for a, a dollar, you can make my purple lights blink some other color. Uh, and if that happens, I will switch focus to that. Uh, I also do want to say that this... Um, this is presented by Sensei, so I want to thank Sensei for supporting this and uh, also like pitching the topic. Uh, you know, Ronnie, you made this pretty easy for me to uh, for me to put together. Usually, I have to like figure out what I have to to work on during this, but um, I'm excited. So let's let's start things off um, again. Any questions that come through around AI and course creation specifically? Um, I'll bring them up on the screen if they're from YouTube or Twitch. If they are over on LinkedIn, uh, they won't come through into Ecamm Live, but I can, I'll can i still like read them out loud. Um, so, uh, Ronnie, first, uh, tell us a little bit about kind of who you are uh, and, and what you do over at Automatic. Sure. Well, I am based in Austin, Texas. I have been in the WordPress community using WordPress in various ways for... I don't know, 13 years or so. I went to school to be a teacher, to be a math teacher. And I did that for six years, taught algebra, calculus, all that sort of good stuff. But the whole time I was teaching, I was building little side projects, mostly around like technology that could help educators or could be used in, in learning. Um, I also did some work teaching undergrad students and critical thinking and, and online teaching. So that was really my background. And then um, I got into to working on uh, Campus Press and EduBlogs, and which, are, which I stayed there for like a good 11 plus years, uh, growing those WordPress platforms, also kind of in the sphere of education. And then I moved over about a year and a half ago to Automatic to really take a look at Sensei LMS plugin and tools there and have been help, helping kind of shape that product, working with excellent team of developers and designers and marketing folks and, um, you know, moving that project forward. And so it's, it's I've always kind of worked at this intersection of web, education, content. I mean, in my day-to-day -day role has been in product uh, development, product marketing, and then also on content and, and, and marketing side of things as well. So uh, kind of, kind of varies and, and comes and goes over the years. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And I really, I mean, we, you know, we got connected um, last year at some point uh, after your predecessor had reached out to me and we worked together on some content, but um, throughout that time, since I was kind of reconnected to Sensei, I, I, well, so I should say I used Sensei, uh, in 2016, that is what I was going to use to sell my online courses. Um, and, uh, I decided to go with, uh, LearnDash instead. But since again, being reconnected to Sensei, I've been really impressed with the work, uh, that y'all have been putting out over there. Um, just like the, the user experience and, 
of course how how well it integrates with with WooCommerce, which is you know kind of table stakes for Sensei. Um, but the the block patterns and the templates and and the themes too. Uh, it's 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 been really impressive. And um, there's a you just you just launched something else else new right to make it uh, easier for course creators to get up and running with with Sensei uh, for their online courses. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, we've been working on kind of the whole package. Um, like, you know, my background, my passion is in in the learner experience and adult education as well. So it's everything is kind of through that lens. But the learner experience is best when like the person putting the courses together, the content creator, the educator, you know, has good tools at their disposal. So we've launched uh, a lot of different ways to make things like distraction free have the course experience modern work really well on mobile it's been a big focus and then just how to customize um, some of the email automation that goes out which you can definitely talk about that's that's pretty recent and new too but there's always something in the in the pipeline and of course like i think every single business in the in the world we've kind of like dropped everything and also are, are looking at like what can we do with ai and so we also have some things in the works there too yeah so so let's get into that you actually mentioned a couple of things um first one is managing emails and this is this is something that i don't think enough people think about until it becomes a problem so like for me um i had uh, a membership site set up with uh I think it was WooCommerce memberships that would um, automatically register new members in all of my Learn Dash courses. And I was like, yeah, this is exactly what I want. But what I also had was uh, an automation um, inside of Learn Dash called Follow Up. It was like an add on called Follow Up Emails at the time, where you can send emails to uh, students based on actions they take, right? So, when they register, when they complete, after this lesson, if they haven't logged in for a week or whatever, right? So any, any of these things can kick off an email. And so I had one welcoming them to the course, except I had it for every course. And so when they got registered for every course, they got an email, a discrete email for every course. Um, I had about 10 courses on the site at the time. And I also they also got their uh, receipt. And they got their welcome to the membership. And so their first experience was getting 12 emails <laughs> by making one purchase. Uh, and I just never thought about it, right? Because I, I plugged and played a few things and things work as I tested them. Except, you know, the secret is that my user was already registered for every course. Uh, so I just tested the payment gateway. So um, let's let's talk a little bit about this and uh and email reminders and things like that because again i think like an online course is um you can have horror stories like mine but you can also create a really good experience for the learner if you have those set up the right way i mean some things that come to mind is first i think we all think that there's email fatigue right i mean email fatigue is real we are inundated by most of us probably hundreds of emails a day. And, um, you know, as a result, we're seeing open rates on email lists, like mass marketing email list, maybe going down um, and things like that. But if someone's interested in your course or like we do actually read a lot of the emails that are sent to us. Right. And so I, I just, what I'm getting at is like I caution people against saying like, well, emails don't matter because no one's going to open them or I'm afraid of sending too many emails. Like if they're engaged in your course, they're going to want to see that email, see what's next. It, it's like the best way really that we have, the best tool that we have of communicating directly with those people that have enrolled in real time, like when when they need some information. So things that we've done is... First of all, like, you know, I've been around WordPress long enough to know WordPress isn't built to be an email management tool, right? And depending on your host and the configurations there, like the deliverability of emails sent via WordPress can can vary a ton, 
you know, on if you're in a shared environment, that IP might be flagged and more likely to end up in spam folders or just the way that the email is written, more likely to be flagged to spam or not be received. And so, you I know, you have is, to, I think there's something that's really a important. whole conversation. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I, and I just like, yeah, it's a whole conversation. We won't get into it, but <laughs> it is something to be mindful of. Right. Cause like I've ordered like some high end stuff from WooCommerce stores. Uh, one is like this pen that like a fountain pen I really love, but like, his emails were going to spam and I was, I was like, I said like, Hey man, looks like you're using WooCommerce and WordPress and you're probably sending emails right from the server. Uh, whatever, like crummy hosting he was using. No offense, um, to the guy who's not watching this. <laughs> um, but, uh, so I was like, Hey, like these are a couple of plugins that could help, right? Like uh, right. SMTP or whatever, whatever. But, um, it's definitely not something like you said, it's not an, an email. WordPress is not meant to be an email service provider or email manager or anything like that. And so, right. um, but it's also not something that one thinks of because when they set up an e-commerce store, they expect to be able to send emails. And like even someone as tech savvy as me, I, it's always an afterthought for me. Like after the first email comes out and I, I, I get the test email, it's like joe at org, but from WordPress. And I'm like, oh, I got to set this other plugin up again. I forgot about that. Well, yeah. And we try to make it easy out of the box uh, to work. We also have just recently added some pretty big integrations with MailPoet and with Automate Woo, which both in different ways can help with customizing the emails. MailPoet works really well to help with the deliver deliverability issues with email. Um, also, like you mentioned, you know, SMTP, depending on your host, they might have things in place that can help, help there, but it's something to look into if you're relying on these emails, you know, making sure that they're delivered and not showing up in spam. And so when we're adding email tools in, we're trying to add in it in ways that we can like do everything that we can to make the spam gods happy. And also don't feel bad about like, um, not being able to keep your emails out of spam. I'm a big Google like fanboy, I guess, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. I'm in all the Google groups and uh, like only use Android products and everything pretty much. I get emails all the time from Google itself that end up in my spam folder in Gmail, which is like a Google service. So if Google can't figure out how to send me emails <laughs> that don't get marked by spam, you know, I don't feel so bad. It's, it's a complex issue. But um, yeah, that's such that's such a good point. Right. It's I mean, worth like, looking into though. Yeah. 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 <laughs> awesome. And you mentioned MailPoet. MailPoet came into the automatic fold a couple of years ago, I think, right? Yeah. I don't remember exactly when. And it also, you know, is, uh, works really closely with, with WooCommerce and automating all your store purchases and stuff there and just making those, those look better. Um, so what we've done is now you can, um, you automatically get a mail poet list for everyone that's in a course or that's in a sensei group so nice. that you can send out mass emails or you can use some of their automation tools. Like, uh, I mean, just a whole bunch of different possibilities that it opens up. You can send an email based on if they purchased a specific product in the past or something like that to a course. So yeah. You can get pretty creative. That's, that's awesome. And I mean, that makes perfect sense, right? Cause I think, Again, one of the things that, you know, I mean, I've been in the WordPress space since like 2004. So like before WordPress had pages, <laughs> like it was just, it was literally just a blog when I first started using WordPress. Um, and, you know, and, and, and the people in the WordPress space and, and developers and agencies, like they would do this piecemeal thing. But I think especially moving into the creator economy, which is who I'm talking to mostly now, um, they're not hiring an agency to set up their online store, right? And they're not. And so these are integrations that they need to think about. And I mean, to WooCommerce's credit, especially like the onboarding process is really good. I think it's really good, at least um, someone who's used a lot of WordPress plugins and most are just like, if there's nothing when you install the plugin, I either think like, well, there's nothing to do. It's just doing its thing. Or like now I've got to hunt down the settings page, but like, WooCommerce, I think, does a really good job of like putting things front and center and, and like, you know, you probably need this, like tax calculation, whatever. Um, and so having tools that integrate like that are, um, I think, super important. And MailPoet, full disclosure, they years ago sponsored my podcast. Um, <laughs> but uh, 
you know, I think they were they're doing a really good job of that. Yeah, and I think it's this connection piece of getting all these tools. Like we want to play nicely with with everything we can, with membership plugins, with other mail services besides mm -hmm. MailPoet and all that too, because that's the beauty of the ecosystem that we're in. Is that you know you get to choose what you need and what works for you at that time and not pigeonholed into one thing. Yeah, absolutely. You get to, you get to choose your service. Um, so let's, uh, let's move into the, the main event here, right? There's, a, we, you know, enough dilly dallying. Um, let's talk about AI. Let's talk about AI a little bit first from like a, a philosophical standpoint, right? And then we'll get into kind of the practical applications of course creation, uh, you know, thinking about it for a couple minutes, I think probably what I use it for in podcasting is very similar to how it could be used in course creation, but I'm really curious to hear what, what you have to say about that. But again, um, what is your personal philosophy? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I that's kind of why I reached out yeah. to you because yeah, yeah, this yeah. is what I'm developing it. And that's like yeah. the first thing off the bat, I have done nothing but listen to dozens and dozens of podcasts from experts on this right over the last couple of months. And I, I don't, um, I mean, none of us are experts because this right. doesn't exist yet. <laughs> we don't really know what the potential is going to be. We don't really know, you know, where this is ending up. But I have to say what I want instead of a philosophy, what I hope we get out of this is I don't want us to get to a place where the robots, the AI is writing our entire course for us, writing an entire blog post for us. And we just blindfully like hit publish and, run students through that course or something like that. I think I've already seen, we have people doing that. They're like, oh, I can go create 10 courses this weekend, copy paste it in, sell it, and you know, try to make a quick buck. Um, you know, the downside of that is, well, first of all, the AI is still sometimes giving you, you know, bad information. Um, it's hallucinating. It's you know telling you things that are not necessarily true. So we for you know we need to be mindful of that. But that's not going to be an engaging course. I, I I think a lot about course creators, and I believe a million percent that like putting people through courses, you know, having a bunch of courses available for people to sign up for learn on their own pace at their own time things they're excited about and interesting in like that's not going anywhere it's a good industry to be in it's it's really a needed thing for the world really and but if we have a whole bunch of really bad low quality courses out there and that's someone's first experience as a student mm -hmm. like they're way less likely to ever go try again and um i think we saw that with MOOCs like 10 years ago, the massive yeah. online open courses or whatever they were right. called, the universities were rolling out left and right. They were not good learning experiences for the most part because they were thrown together quickly and they just tried to like convert a textbook into the course. Millions of people signed up for these things. The completion rate was like sometimes like 1% or something right. like really low no one signed up for a, a second one, right? Because they didn't have a great first experience. Yeah. And gosh, that's such that's a, such a throwback that we we talked about that when I worked in higher ed like ten yeah. years ago. Um, and first of all, I'm a New York Italian, and MOOC is like a derogatory term. <laughs> <laughs> the first time I heard the VP of IT at the University of Scranton say MOOC, I was like, "Hey, who are you talking to?" Over? Like, I just got very like, um, "Can he say? Is he allowed to say that?" But, uh, I mean, to our credit, like, we never, like, rushed to roll out one, right? Like, we really, and, like, by the time, well, I left before this, but, like, again, by the time we were kind of, like, ready, we kind of saw the the pitfalls of it, right? Um, because, like, if you're going to just throw, like, if I want to learn something, sure, I can go read an academic paper on it, but, like you said, it's going to be an awful experience, like I'm going to have questions. It's going to be so boring. Um, and that's almost like what I think about when I think of like AI generated courses, you're basically just saying like, take all of this information and spit it out on a page, put it into lessons, 
you think it should be in, right? Which is not thinking about the learning experience. No. Um, because like AIs can't possibly know that, like how each individual will learn. And so, you know, that's that's kind of what I thought about as you were talking there. But I'm sorry, I like I interrupted your philosophy. But no, I, I like that. About, yeah, I like that. And so, where I hope we're going is that well, on a couple of fronts, you can now like have some of that boring stuff though that research, like writing the textbook for you almost. Right mm -hmm. now, your job as the course creator is to put all of that extra stuff, the extra elements into the course that make it interactive, make it engaging, building a community around the course, possibly you know adding some collaborative elements, one-on-one -on -one coaching with the instructor or group coaching with the instructor. Those sorts of things are gonna be really what set courses apart. So this idea of like evergreen courses that are text-based and like hands-off automated, I think we're going to have a handful of people maybe in, in certain niches, like be somewhat successful with that. But by and large, like the real value from this is going to be if we can help put tools in the hands of creators that, that go way above and beyond that, right? And make that accessible. Um, and so AI can help us build the foundation, which we can talk more about like specifics and prompts and all that. But um, I don't know. I mean, what do you think about about that i i'm developing this like you know in real time constantly evolving in my thoughts right. so. well because i mean it's <laughs> like i mean this is maybe recency effect but i can't think of another technology and again i've been in technology for over 20 years at this point um you know and i can't think of something that evolved as rapidly as like generative ai tools um and so, like, I've talked about it a little bit on on the podcast. And, like, I had to, like, put a disclaimer. Like, hey, we were talking about this in January, and it's, like, March now. And like, things like, everything is totally different. All <laughs> and so, um, I, you know, and so, like, it is it is that constant evaluation. The other thing, I think, again, as you were talking, what made me, what where my brain went was the idea of the flipped classroom. Right. So like anybody who's unfamiliar with the idea of the flipped classroom, it was that um, the student would essentially like read the lectures at home and then do the assignments in class. And when I first heard about this, I was like, oh, this is brilliant. Right. Like this is this makes so much sense. You read the material and then like you work through the comprehension with your fellow students and teacher. But but then I actually started talking to my students about uh those like who had experience with the flipped classroom they're like oh they would just make us like watch youtube videos and i'm like that's not okay you, that's not a learning experience right again all of this information is out there and and I, part of the educator's job is to curate and filter it um and put it into a lens that works best for the people you're talking to and not just throw a bunch of information at them. And so like totally AI tools can help us do that, right? You can write a prompt for chat GPT that's like, uh, I want to teach a group of 10 year olds uh, how to make their first HTML page um, right as an expert web developer talking to a group of 10 year olds. Um, and like, yeah, maybe you'd get something, but like maybe not, <laughs> you know, or like certainly they're going to have questions. Um, certainly they're going to have questions that AI can't possibly anticipate. And so, um, I think that it's a very good assistive tool. It's a good research tool. I remember when like Wikipedia was first emerging and every teacher wanted to ban that because it wasn't a good research tool, but like you had to, it's a good first, I think it's a good first step but it's not going to give you your first draft or your final draft rather. Right. It's, it's going to give you some prompts. It's going to give you some prompts to then go and look for more information. Yeah. And look for like how to make it relevant, how to tell stories that are personal to you as the educator, or maybe that connect specifically with the, with the learner. Um, then you, you're going to want to, I mean, to me, my, my whole like education philosophy is learning is doing not, getting mm -hmm. right yeah. and so um you know 
will have to build ways into the courses to have the students do something that demonstrates that they've explored that new content or whatever it is, or, or played around with it or created something or built something. Um, or maybe it's in a traditional sense, a quiz or something like that. But, um, you know, that's really what makes the course the course or those those experiences. And so, you know, anyone that might be listening that is creating learning experiences, like always be thinking about um, what can you have the, the student do? Well, AI is not giving you that. Maybe you could ask what could the student do to demonstrate that they've done this or, and I've tried that a little bit, like what's an activity that I could do when I wanna teach this concept? And it, depending on what it is, it gives some decent ideas that can get you unstuck. Um, but then you know like how much time you have, what resources are available, all that, that you would have to then tailor it and, and put it into your course. But the course shouldn't be about the content because as of now, the content is trivial. It's everywhere. Like your content's not unique. The right. actual words on the page are not unique. Um, so it's got to be the experiences that are that are the uniqueness. Yeah, I like that. I I always say learn by doing, uh, by doing as well. Um, I you know I want my courses. I want people to have tangible experiences after they take my courses. I want them to walk away from my course and have something virtually in their hands right because i'm usually teaching people how to do things online but like hey i took this course and i made that um i want to give a quick shout out to i hope i'm saying this right kedma menendez uh giving us a little shout out over on linkedin um uh liking and, and promoting the post so thanks kedma um so uh the doing part um, and I, can I, I can bring, the, can I bring this up? Like, this is not my live stream. Um, <laughs> I just want to show this really quick, right? This is the learning pyramid. Uh, and then all of my notes that you see that should have been hidden. Um, this is the learning pyramid, right? And if I can blow this up a little bit more, um, you know, the average student retention rates when they learn something, it's like lecture reading is 10%. Um, and then practice doing is up to 75, right? And like 90% is teaching others. But um, if you're, if, if you are just giving to Ronnie's point, right? If you're just giving people something to read uh, as their course, they're not going to retain that. They're not going to remember that. Um, you probably, I mean, if you're watching on the live stream now, if you're listening, maybe you don't even remember what I just said. Right. Um, but like practical doing, is going to give you a 75% retention rate because you're at your, you're forging new memories of, of you're like for forming new pathways for like actually doing the thing. Right. That, I, that, that was probably the idea of the flipped classroom. Right. In theory. It was. And, it, yeah. and I, I don't have it in front of me and it's been a while. And I think it depends on the topic, you know, the content, the age of the learners. But I think there was some research that showed, especially younger kids where a lot of this was used mm -hmm. that actually didn't show gains in instruction, like in out educational outcomes in many ways. And that kind of surprised a whole bunch of people. Yeah. Um, but, you know, other ways to incorporate that doing into your course, having forums like BB Press forums or comments, um, threaded discussions, having uh, peer review of, of work, um, building that collaboration. And, um, you know, there's all sorts of tools that, that we could add and AI is not going to generate that now. You should expect today that your students are probably going to be using ChatGPT to mm -hmm. like answer those discussion questions or whatever. But you know, that's kind of on them and that's a skill we're all going to learn how to, how to figure out, you know, yeah. what that really yeah. means for us. I will say, right. You asked me about my philosophy. I did write a blog post a couple weeks ago, um, called like chat GPT is, ex ex is exposing like a weakness in our education system or something like that. Um, where I basically talked about how, uh, is exposing our broken education system, right? Because if t my theory, right? And I think based on what you've said, you might agree with this. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but um, if teachers are banning chat GPT from, uh, from the classroom wholesale, first of all, you're now depriving students of a skill that they are going to need when they get into the workforce. Like you're going to need to know how to leverage generative AI. Um, but also, um, but also, 
that means you're just giving assignments that are regurgitation assignments, right? Like if you tell me to write a, a paper about like the Battle of Shiloh, right? Uh, and ChatGPT can write that paper and it covers everything that you told me I had to do. That's not a problem with ChatGPT. That's a problem with the assignment. Like you're just making me memorize and regurgitate, right? Um, instead of like critically think, right, about the Battle of Shiloh or whatever. Shiloh's fresh in my mind because my daughter goes to school with someone with that name. And I was like, why would you name your kid after the bloodiest battle in the Civil War? <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, yeah no, that's I, – I, I completely agree. Um, and, you know, for course creators in – so, you know, we work with people of all different types of courses that they're creating, right? There's some that are for like certifications and you have like strict um, either legal obligations or like some something that you have to make sure that they know and that are taught and is covered. And then you have much more fun, um, you know, hobbies and things like that, that people that we, you know, all sorts of stuff. And then everything in between it depends on your course it depends on the topic but you can you definitely want to bring in community some way and, mm -hmm. and the option for that um however you can even if that community is external to the course that you're just opening the door to or something like that yeah absolutely and now that we've gotten that out of the way right um <laughs> uh, ai tools can be helpful um and i think something that um uh, we're teed up to talk about is something that I always, always struggle with, right? I make courses for LinkedIn learning. Um, and if I'm not doing like, if I'm not doing a coding course, right. Where like the, the doing part, the assessment part is obvious. It's like, take this code, write this code. Right. And usually I'll like say, all right, well, I'm going to let's write this code, pause this video here, try to do it yourself. And then we'll walk through my solution. Um, if it's not that, then they want me to write quiz questions. And I hate, hate writing quiz. Because, like, they're so, to me, they're, like, so contrived. The way I write them. I'm really bad at writing. I just say that right off the bat, right? It's always, like, four. One is, I think, the obvious answer. One is a very obviously not the answer. It's, like, just totally out of left field. Um, and then, but it's, like, it's something I spend, I think, a um inequitable amount of time on when it comes to creating the course um but it sounds like sensei is about to integrate something that could, could maybe help me yeah this is our first our first tool that we're building in and so what we wanted to avoid um was not having this like chat interface that you have everywhere else with mm -hmm. with ai tools we just kind of want it to be magic wherever we can and so you already have a lesson in Sensei and the lesson has content. Then you can click a button to create a quiz. I mean, that's how it works now. When you do that, we'll ask, well, do you want us to generate a few quiz questions for you? And we did a lot of testing and we found that like ChatGPT usually writes three good questions. If you ask for more <laughs> than three, they get really repetitive. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were just showing three quiz questions and they for now they're, they're multiple choice but what i like about it is we can take it a step further we then asked it we'll also display why the right answer is correct mm -hmm. and why each wrong answer is not correct like why is that the wrong answer and then we so when the learner is taking the quiz and they choose the wrong answer they'll immediately get the feedback that you know, this is why this is the wrong answer and here's the right answer and here's why. So it's like reinforcing right in real time. And, you know, we could do that when we're building the course, but like you said, it's pretty time consuming. It's also a little challenging. Um, and I think once you, I've been playing with these a bunch, like it kind of helps train the course creator too, like on writing better quizzes and writing mm. better feedback. So then you can yeah. extend and write a fourth and a fifth. And we don't want you to just use the quiz questions exactly as they come out of the box. Like we're hoping you're reviewing them and making sure that it's right. a good question and like it's the right answer and all that. But um, that's just like one way of starting. And it's, you don't have to worry about writing a prompt. We've, we're customizing those prompts for you all in the background and then putting it into the blocks 
so no copy pasting or anything like that. It transforms it into Gutenberg and into the quiz editor. Um, oh, that's which is pretty awesome. cool. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And like the why is it right? Why is it wrong? Like that's another thing that I really struggle with. I'm just like the right. I like well, I feel like when I say when I write why is this the right answer, I can also put that in the why is this the wrong answer, right? Like yeah, like, yeah. Why is A the right answer? There, the A is the right answer for these reasons. Why is B the wrong answer for the reasons that A is the right answer? But that's like but not really helpful, right? It's like and it's and you want to just kind of copy and paste what you've already written because you already wrote the right answer, you know, up above yeah, or whatever in the text. Right. But ChatGPT does a pretty good job of like writing it in a slightly different way that might connect with them a little bit better right. or, or something like that and not feel super repetitive. So, um, you know, that's just the first thing we're playing with. Um, right after that, it's getting to creating. We, we found that just creating the course outline, which you can already go to ChatGPT or I've been using Bard a lot too. Um, nice. I think that ChatGPT established yeah. earlier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. And so, um, you know, you can already ask it for a course outline based on the course topic and all that. But what we're doing is well, you have to put a course title in when you create a new course. And we ask you right after that what like the objectives are of the course. Mm. Well, now we already have all the information we need to write the prompts for you. Yeah. Um, so then we can generate a, an outline and say, do you like this? You can just start blank if you want, like you're not forced to use it. But if you choose to use it, you can easily customize it, edit it, but hopefully you know, the goal is to get people to publish their first course faster. That's like the metric we're trying to improve because yeah. we're a business. You know, we have to be. Um, but, and, and similarly, and I mean, also less, like starting a course thing. is like the hardest part, right? I, I mean, yeah. to me, it is. some people, <laughs> yeah. there are like people who have a hard time starting and some people have time like getting a hard time getting over the finish line. I am 100% in the starting. Yeah. I will stare at a problem for like a week and be like, yeah, I really got to start this. But like... <laughs> Again, generative AI has been that made that a little bit easier, right? And like getting an outline, at least like you said, gets the ideas flowing, and that's like super helpful. And so, yes, like you're a business, you want people to make more courses, obviously, but like that is also extremely beneficial to the course creator who probably wants to get the course done as soon as oh, yeah. possible so they can start selling it, right? No, we want. I mean, we want. We want to make tools that makes their lives easier and better yeah. and a better end result of the course and everything yeah. like that. Helps them learn how to use the our tool as well, because that is kind of the hardest piece is that very beginning, just getting right. used to the course. And so if it already has the lessons laid out there with the titles, it, it all just makes a lot more sense to yeah. teach you how to use the tool, which is a big part of it too. And we'll do the same for lessons. We know the lesson title. We know the lesson objectives. We can, I'm nervous about this one. I, we're not going to publish it if it's not good content, but mm -hmm. like, I'm hoping we can write it in ways like tell a story ab around this topic or yeah. like try to make it more engaging or ask discussion questions for this topic. So it's not just like regurgitating a textbook of content, right? Like it's going to vary based on what the topic is that it give you some lesson output, help build some of that, um, you know, interactive elements into the lesson for you. Yeah, I really, I really like that. Um, cause usually, you know, when I start, when I start on a course, the first thing I'll do is, um, this is like course or book, um, is I'll like do a mind map of like everything I know about the topic. Right. Um, and so like, even if I start there, right, I could still ask chat GPT or Bard, um, which by the way, I tried Bard when it first came out. Um, it's not as good, I'll be honest. Yeah, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, I kind of feel like Google's like scared of how good it could actually be, and like they're probably throttling it a little bit. Oh, interesting. Um, just based on what I've read, pre Bard coming out, um, but like, is that is that rapidly is that changing rapidly? Because I know like one of the things that Bard can do that ChatGPT can't is like get the content of a website, right? Yeah, it does that. Um, and I use Bing actually a lot too. Oh, nice. <laughs> like I'll test them all and Bing yeah. is chat GPT4, but it does the website stuff. And I really like the way it cites its sources oh. and tells you where it pulled the information. Um, Dang, one, that's awesome. Yeah, one, thing, one thing I like about Bard is it usually gives you three versions of whatever it writes. And so you can immediately see what's different between the three versions. So that's pretty cool too. That's awesome. But, um, 
I want to give uh, Kedma a quick shout out here in the chat. She's saying, I think like coming up with quiz questions and reasons very challenging. And then um, sounds like she's in agreement that uh, starting putting up with the problem for a week. Um, it's time. So Kedma, <laughs> yeah. thanks for your comments. Thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, sorry. Um, uh, this is going to make great like. Uh, where i'm releasing the recording in in my podcast feed there's gonna be like great podcast content just like mentioning the <laughs> comments and stuff like that um i'll link to the youtube video in the show notes so if you're listening to this look in the description and you can then watch the actual live stream if you want um but uh sorry yeah so so uh bard gives you three um variations right i also yeah. like that i like that too and i'm hoping we kind of build that in maybe with it's kind of like we're doing three quiz questions. You can right. choose to have all three. Um, but with the outlines, we might have it do a short course outline or a more complicated course outline with like modules or something. So we can show you the differences. Um, that is, is something we're, we're actively kind of looking into. Nice. Wanda, thanks for being here. Great topic. I'm really enjoying yeah. this. Um, yeah, so I, Ronnie, I want to thank you again for being here. We'll be here for a little while longer, but uh, this is this is so interesting to me because again, I think leveraging. Uh, so, uh, have, did you read Bill Gates's article about AI, like the future of AI, and and how it could help people? I don't think I. Re I mean, I know I didn't read it. I've heard mm -hmm. bits and pieces of. What I, Your my biggest friends. takeaway and what I liked best from it was uh, he basically said that my job is safe, right? Educators, the world's always going to need educators and the world's always going to need nurses. So like my job and my wife's job are safe. Um, but uh, to that point, right? Anybody at this moment can look up anything they want, right? Uh, you can find information on anything and, um, but that doesn't mean that schools and educational institutions are eliminated, right? Because you still need someone with the experience to discern and distill and filter out the garbage, right? Um, and so I think like what we're talking about here is how chat GPT or other generative AI tools can help us make better content give us better ideas right because we as educators we still only have like our personal lens right so like i mean i don't want to um disparage programmers i am a programmer but like i've i've said this before right where like i'll be talking to a client and they'll want a feature and i'll be like why would you want that right <laughs> like which is just such a conceited thing to think and say um but like the same could be said in, in the education setting, right? Like I might not think of something that the, uh, the learner might need to learn. Whereas a few good prompts from chat GPT might show me like I'm teaching WordPress and most people don't know the difference between a page and a post that comes from a real life experience where my student was like, what are you even talking about? Like, what's the <laughs> difference? Um, so things like that, if you can short circuit that uh, incredulous look from a, an 18 year old student, <laughs> uh, chat GPT could save you a lot of pain. Well, you know what you made me think a little bit about um, chat GPT is so text heavy. And I know that there's some like generative, like art and image tools and even videos we're getting there, but mm -hmm. we, we've kind of been on this trend away from reading a lot of text and moving into like these like TikTok like videos right. for everything, right? Like if you can't if you can't teach it in a in a quick uh, portrait mode TikTok. I mean, forever it was like, how dare you record a video in portrait mode? And now, oh, I know. Um, and so, like, that's a good thing that educators have to remember. Like, depending on the topic, depending on the learner, you kind of set it with their needs. Like some. Things somebody might be able to read and understand. Others, they might be better if they hear it or if they see it in a video or if they get to draw it themselves or whatever. So when we're building our course, we can incorporate all these strategies whenever possible. 
give people yeah. the choice and we don't have to funnel them through the exact same experience as everyone else taking the course. We can give them their options. And that's really what I hope this like AI will help us be able to build those sorts of like just experiences faster. Yeah. And this is something I talk about with like content reuse, right? Um, you know, I've got students who are like, how am I supposed to make all this content? Like, well, you know, it's, uh, record the podcast, use generative AI to get a transcript, have chat GPT clean up that transcript and make it readable and then have it summarize. Right. Oh, and now you have a LinkedIn post, right? Uh, there is, if you are creating text-based courses, like maybe you're not good on, like maybe, you know, I mean, Thomas Jefferson famously delivered his state, state of the union, states of the, the state of the union addresses. There we go. Um, via via written word right because he hated speaking um but i was just looking at this tool by uh 11 labs i don't know if you've seen this one you give it you feed it a sample of your voice and then it will you know generate uh text to speech with your own voice um does a pretty good job if you have like that north american <laughs> kind of accent and dialect um you know i think uh i was listening to a podcast with uh john Voorhees, who's from like chicago and federico vatici who's from rome italy and um definitely worked a little bit better for john than it did for federico so <laughs> probably a very u.s centric tool right now but um you know if you're in a position where you can create audio content you're not comfortable in front of the mic yeah that could be an opportunity right or vice versa ai tools are giving us the ability to meet the learners where they want to be which i think is super great yeah absolutely and like i can write a blog post or an email like in no time that's just mm -hmm. a skill that i've developed but when it comes to trying to record a video like it could take me all day to record a minute because I just like just get stressed out about it and want to re-record a million times and all mm -hmm. that stuff. See, Maybe there's tools that are available that are going to help me, right? Like right. I can write it out and like get it out quickly. Yeah. This is, a, this is one of those knowledge gaps, right? I didn't, cause like I, I'm really good at writing a first draft at least like just getting the words on the page, but I can also just like turn on a video and talk. Um, <laughs> And I didn't realize like this was something like when people were signing up for like ship 30 for 30 or these other like writing cohorts. And I'm like, why are you going to pay 700 bucks to write 300 words a day? Just do it. And then some people are like, I can't just do it. And I'm like, oh, I got it. I yeah. got it. I have a skill that not everybody has. I mean, it, it, it's not like I just figured I could do it so everybody can do it. But I think it's really interesting when you think about those things, right? Turning on a video and and talking is energy like it takes a lot of energy the camera steals energy from you so um but yeah these tools can be a great equalizer i mean yes. i think about uh you know people with dyslexia or dysgraphia like or, or anything really like we can what's dysgraphia again it's uh, writing issues like especially handwritten like okay. handwriting and getting their words onto paper gotcha um like you know, we have such good tools with text to speech that really helps. Mm -hmm. um, I've even seen people use like paste, copy, paste in a whole bunch of text and say like rewrite this in a more friendly format for someone with dyslexia. And it takes out some of like it, there's oh, some tools wow. that people are working on just for that. But like it's just these tools will hopefully be an equalizer for those, those of us both wanting to create content and consume. Right. We will all be a little bit more on an even playing field. Um, yeah, to be absolutely. pretty cool. That's awesome. That's like one of the things everyone's like, why do I, why does my podcast need a transcript? Right. I'm like, well, there's like a lot of reasons, but some people prefer to read. And like the argument will be like, well, our podcast is so conversational that like just the transcript would be terrible to read. And I'm like, all right, well let the reader make that judgment. Right. Like, don't be like, you won't like this anyway. <laughs> um, well, yeah. Well, similarly, if you have a video based course, a course that's heavy with videos, like it, not just having the caption option, but like you can use an accordion to hide it, but put the whole transcript in there. Right. Yeah. So someone can expand, but you're also going to like benefit 
search, if someone's searching through your course, one of the things that I don't know how long this will take or how useful this will be, but I feel like we're going to have these chat bots that follow us on every website we visit now. So mm -hmm. the idea is like, and we're kind of looking into this, like an AI tool where you could chat with the course. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, so having that transcript in there is going to make building these tools and add-ons later so much better. So I would definitely Someone think about just that. told me about a tool like this. It's not on this piece of paper. <laughs> I thought it oh. was. Um, <laughs> but it's like you feed it a bunch of your content, video content, audio content, and it transcribes it. It transcribes it, and then you basically say like, um, where do I talk about? Uh, this was a real estate example, right? So like, where do I talk about um, HOAs? And this chatbot comes back and it's like, in this video at minute nine, you talk about HOAs, right? Like, so these tools are already being developed and that is absolutely bananas to me. And even more than like search results like that, it'll like synthesize, like, what did we talk about with HOAs in there? And right. it'll like summarize instead of you having to read the transcript and... And so I feel like that's coming. I don't know how far in the future, but your course will have a chat bot that someone can like, you know, ask questions of the course. Right. Um, every Just website like, has it with documentation and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, completely indexed. Right. And then this yeah. is, I mean, cause this follows the trend and I'm aware we're coming up on time here. Um, so if anybody has any, any questions uh, for me or more importantly, Ronnie, um, leave them in the chat. I'll make sure we get to them. Um, but you know, the trend for the last few years has been, um, I first heard, uh, uh, Chris Badgett from Lifter uh, use this term, um, like just in time learning, mm -hmm. right. Where people have a problem they want to solve and they want to find course material in that moment, uh, to help them. And so this, the tool is called searchy. I'll put it in the chat here. Um, oh, nice. But this is like, this is the, the tool I was talking about that like indexes your own content for you. This is like definitely something I'm going to be playing with probably on the next live stream. Uh, either that or like generating an outline for my next book idea. Um, <laughs> but uh, having a tool like this means that you can have uh, over six or 14 hours of course content and like that doesn't feel daunting to the the learner anymore right because i think this was like another thing that like course creators felt like they had to do was just like put as much content as possible because content equals value but like outcomes equal value um so. and these micro courses are like a big thing and a good yeah. i mean you can learn so much in 15 minutes yeah and like, absolutely you know and you could you could sell that easily right um you know, and, and get good value out of it. So, yeah, that's like a tactical error I made recently where, um, I've got over a hundred videos, probably like 125 videos on podcasting. And, um, they were all in kind of self-paced courses. They were mostly in one big self-paced course. And I just kind of turned it into a membership where you could search for videos. And, uh, I thought this was really the way to go like Netflix style search for your topic. Um, what I didn't anticipate was for like, I kind of priced myself out of the market um, for my target audience, but also like sometimes people don't know what they don't know. And so if I give them a, a micro course or a mini course where it's like how to start a podcast for less than 400 bucks. Oh, well that's the thing that they know that they need or how to get your first podcast sponsor. Right. Now, let's not think long term about generating hundreds of thousands of dollars off of sponsorships. Let's just talk about getting your first sponsorship. Is that worth 50 bucks to you? Well, yeah, yep. totally. And then you can cross sell, upsell, right, you know, exactly. link, all that sort of good stuff. Yeah. Especially into like a one on one coaching thing or whatever it may be. Yeah, so. that's exactly right. And the mistake I made, learn from this mistake, friends. Um, I tried to bundle it all together. Like you get all 120 videos. And live cohorts with me and a one-on-one -on -one session with me. And I thought I was throwing in a lot of value, but it kind of sounds overwhelming, right? And so like people who bought and now we're six months in they, and they're like, do I still have that one-on-one -on -one coaching session with you? Like, and maybe if I let more people buy it when they're ready, right? If I get them in and they, I solve their immediate problem, then the upsell, the cross sell is, is better. And so um, not really generative AI, but just like 
kind of the theory of I I think we're moving towards uh, away from by the college degree, right? <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And and we're moving more towards like by the skill, right? We're moving from like the big like four six year universities to the trade school again. So. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I want to wrap up here with um. Uh, we touched on the stuff that that you're doing. Uh, obviously, you work for Automatic. Automatic has a lot of different tools. Automatic, for those who don't know, uh, they run WordPress.com, own Wor- WooCommerce. Uh, and therefore Sensei, Mail Poet, Jetpack, a lot of other things that I'm probably forgetting. Um, did I miss anything major there? Did I name all the major properties? I well, for anyone it. listening, Pocket Cast. It's my favorite. Pocket Cast, of course. <laughs> um, God, and Pocket Cast is amazing. Uh, n- hashtag not a sponsor, but <laughs> I, I really... Um, the web interface is still like the best of any podcast app I've ever used. Um, yeah. So great point. Pocket casts, uh, lots of other great stuff. So, um, is there like an overarching philosophy inside of automatic? I know automatic has for a long time been very like, let the teams do their things ship. Um, but as you've grown, maybe you've, you've gotten a more like company wide philosophy. Does that question make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And it's a little bit of both. I mean, I think uh, Matt Mullenweg, our founder, CEO, like posted in a publicly in a post data channel recently, like, you know, he thinks everyone across the entire WordPress ecosystem needs to learn AI deeply and experiment. And it's like, I think like everyone, it's taken over. Um, like it's something every team is talking about and is thinking about how to incorporate in their own way and that the teams have the autonomy and you know to figure out what works best everything from like tools that we're using internally like i now have a chat bot to ask like how you know like sensei's subscriber numbers are changing over time Mm -hmm. or whatever instead of looking for a graph all the way up to like getting it into the hands of users creating content in different ways also a big focus around uh, we have so much content uh, uh, from forums and from courses and from blog posts, you know, about how to use WordPress, WordPress.com and all these sorts of things that like, you know, how can we use AI to to help synthesize all that and, and get the user what they want to know from, from a support aspect. So it, it really runs the picture there, but it is like every team for themselves. We are working on like some centralized like um, API tools that we can all use as so that that like some of the dirty behind the scenes under the hood work can be taken care of for us so we can just build faster which is pretty cool nice that's amazing um we'll have to get into this at a later date right but like customer service is a, probably a really good place where ai could be helpful right and this yeah. is like the first quote unquote chatbots i feel like chatbot has a totally different meaning now than even like 2 years ago but like you would see that in in the chat box that, you know, you have a little bubble on the site and it's like, Hey, how can I help you? Like the support chat. And it's like, Oh, well, Oh, it looks like you said the word migrate here. Like, have you looked at these FAQ articles? And it was rarely what you needed, right? It was yeah. rarely what you needed. Right? But like <laughs> now, right. It feels yeah. like it'll be less rare. And also like the folks, you know, handling, which their job is unreal and I could never do like, handling multiple live chats and tickets and like helping people all day long like they're the heroes but they also have access to this data and it's like a lot to keep up with Mm -hmm. too um to help them like search and and find the right way to say it that worked for someone in the past or something right and yeah that's pretty cool absolutely i'm I'm gonna um end with a a question that i'm curious about uh because i know for a while Every new hire at Automatic had to work support for two weeks. Did you have to do that? I did, yeah. And I had to do Woo support, and I had never really used Woo. Oh, wow. And so it was quite eye-opening, and I'm, I'm due for getting back in there for a week. Nice. Yeah, is that something that you can just like optionally do at any time? Or uh, It's once a year. Everyone once needs to do a, do a week. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's such a, good, such a good thing, right? I um, just migrated to Transistor.fm for my podcast host. And uh, the guy helping me support was also like the co-founder. 
uh, mm-hmm. Justin Jackson. And I just thought that was like such a great thing. Like, oh, well, like, because, you know, some people are like, I'm the CEO and like they're too good for like the grunt work. But like, he's like, yeah, let me help you with that really quick. Just really no, quick. absolutely. Everyone in the company, I mean, from like the accountants and the lawyers to the developers wow. to everyone. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. I know I've seen screenshots of like Matt jumping in to from time to time, which is cool. Yep. yep. Um, that's amazing. And then the last thing I'll just mention here is uh, of the automatic products that I think are worth mentioning that I forgot to mention. Uh, we already mentioned Tumblr. Uh, day one, the journal app, which is super cool. Um, nice to be like, I feel like automatic is a good steward of that app. Uh, and simple note, which again, I feel automatic has been a good steward of that app. So, uh, looking for notes especially for android i feel like and i mean when i was on android it was lacking yeah uh, simple notes was easily the best android based yeah it's been a long time though yeah <laughs> so oh i mean we've all in on open source and making the web better and not just through wordpress which is yeah which is pretty cool awesome well ronnie this has been great thanks so much for joining us here on the live stream today thanks to uh kedma and wanda and all the lurkers uh who were watching or who will be listening to this later uh if people want to learn more about you where can they find you i wrote a post on using conmigo which is khan academy's ai on my blog at ronniebird.com but you can also check us out on senseilms.com uh for all the good stuff we're doing there Nice. And uh, yeah, I will make sure to have, again, links in the description for both this video and the podcast episode. But um, this episode has been presented by Sensei. So uh, if you go to howibuilt.it slash Sensei, you'll get a little a little coupon code if you want to check out Sensei for your own online courses. Uh, I'm going to find this blog post as we speak um, and link that in the show notes as well. So Uh, Oh, great. I found it. Oh, very timely. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, Accounting Cafe, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate you. Uh, Really interesting. Thank you. Ronnie, thanks so much for spending some extra time with us. Yeah, it's fun. A lot of fun. All right. Thank you to everybody watching slash listening. Uh, And until next time, get out there and build something.